Good evening. This is Laws 11059, Statutory Interpretation. This is John Milburn. It's week six and it's the 22nd of December 2016. This is term three, 2016. Tonight we're talking about um, a number of things. The scheduled topic is intrinsic material, statute components, and it's based on chapter six of our text. Before we start, just a couple of things. The first is that as usual, we have a number of people joining us live, but not nearly as many as I'd like. So as a New Year's resolution, if you're looking to have one, how about you resolve to join us live for more of the Zoom sessions? You're welcome to come along. Of course, I'm talking to those people that aren't joining us live for the moment. We thank you for doing so. So we've got a number of people here. We've got a few questions. You can always unmute your microphone. And of course, you can use the chat facility if you wish to um, ask a question uh, using that facility. All right, the next thing I want to talk about is the assessment. Um, the first assessment is in. I've um, considered many of the papers already. The standard is high. It's, um, this, is a, this is a good cohort, so well done. Um, let's see if we can keep up the intensity and the quality of the work throughout the course. Um, I don't mark pursuant to a bell curve. So in case you're wondering whether I allocate a certain number of HDs or Ds or Cs, I don't. Um, I simply mark the papers as I see it. But I am a pretty hard marker. So if you're getting good marks, um, I think it really means that you're, you're doing well. But um, I would love to see lots and lots of people go through and get distinctions um, or better. In terms of the first assessment, I'll have those results to you probably early next week, early in January, uh, sorry, you know, around the 28th or 29th of December. I normally try to get them on the Sunday or the Monday after close, but of course, Sunday is Christmas Day. If you haven't submitted your work, you have until 11.45 p.m. on Christmas Eve. Otherwise, whether you've got an extension or not, I just won't mark your paper, you'll get a zero. In terms of the second assessment piece, can I say that's probably the hardest piece of assessment I have to write. Um, coming up with a scenario is really difficult. And um, I've had to create some what I've called typo alerts and clarification alerts. For those of you that were quickly onto these things, thank you very much. It means that we're now able to offer a better product for people to consider. Um, so the typo alerts were, I, I read this thing 20 times literally after I wrote it and not once did I pick up that I'd reverted back to Queensland instead of Kingsland. So there was that change. And also I'd slipped between Chief Commissioner to Chief Executive. So it should be Kingsland throughout and it should be um, Chief Commissioner throughout. Also, uh, and that's in section 14, I think I went chief executive instead of chief commissioner. In fact, it was section 14 where I made those both mistakes, Queensland instead of Kingsland and executive instead of commissioner. Um, there was a very good question asked of me in relation to the basis upon which the chief commissioner produced the firefighters manual and whether it was a standard or a regulation. And when I looked at that, I thought, well, really, the Chief Commissioner is not going to be conferred power um, to, make to make regulations. So it is, of course, a standard, and uh, thank you very much for that. Um, so it is a standard. In terms of um, clarification about what to refer to or not, of course, this is fictional legislation. So the only legislation I want you to consider other than the fictional legislation in the problem is interpretation legislation. Can anyone tell me an example of interpretation legislation? In New South Wales, it would be the Interpretation Act, 1987. Am I right? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know the year of the New South Wales interpretation legislation, but that sounds like right, Leone. Okay. Other examples of interpretation legislation that I do encourage you to refer to if relevant. Commonwealth. 
What's the Commonwealth Act called? The Ex Interpretation Act. It's in 1901. I think that's spot on. Does anyone disagree with what Sharon said? All right. And what about in Queensland? Ex Interpretation Act 1954. 54. Yes, that's it. And. Uh, Pavia came in with that um, answer at the same time as well. So thank you very much. All right, so that's what I mean by interpretation legislation. Um, and of course, you can refer to any cases you like in support of your argument. Now, Sharon, you asked a really good question about the rubric. Um, so I have now posted something on Moodle. I need to explain something. I'm not allowed to do this. So my superiors will really be annoyed with me for doing this, but it's only a small tweak. What's that? Sorry, Sharon. Turn, turn, turn the camera off. Turn, <laughs> stop recording. Stop recording. <laughs> Professor Colburn, if you're watching this, please excuse me. Um, <laughs> look, I just want to explain something. In the assessment criteria, which is part of the um, unit profile, it sets out the basic goals, it sets out the higher order goals, it sets out the skills that we're looking for. I haven't changed any of that. Everything is exactly the same as it was on the unit profile, but I've changed, I've tweaked the weighting. And I've tweaked the weighting in favour of a higher level on skills and higher order goals and a little less on the basic goals. Now, what I mean by that is this. In first year, I am very keen to ensure that you present something that looks the part. And I, and I keep saying it, you know, look at my sample document, look at the way that authors write their textbook material, look at the way judges write their judgments. In first year, I place greater emphasis on the presentation than will be the case in second or third year. By second or third year, you're expected to know the presentation and present something that looks right. But in first year, I really want to drum it into you. Now, why on earth should I do that? Who cares what the presentation is like? Anyone got a thought? If you don't get it right now, you'll never get it right. It's a good That's foundation. a very good argument. Yes, Jay? Um, I think... Good presentation reflects good organisation. So if you're presenting well, your argument should flow, it should be well constructed, it should be a complete package. Yes, that's a very good reason as well. Thank you. Any we other reason? Yes, Dakota? We won't have any, won't have any bad habits. We'll just start the right way. Yes. Not, we're starting from scratch. We're not halfway through and then learning how to do it in a different way. Have good good habits, yes. Any other reasons why presentation is important? Yes, Sharon? Sorry, if you're handing something up to a judge, he wants to be able to read it and to understand exactly what it's um, all about. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yep. It's got, to, it's got to look the part. Don't hand up something to a judge uh, which is from an unauthorised report. So, for example, you've just got to grain these habits in. But it's got to look the part. What other reasons? Why else? What other uh, reasons have I got for um, insisting on good presentation, Sharon? Well, if it's more professional and you don't look sloppy, so if you're dealing with like being a lawyer is basically all about communication in some form or another. So if you can't get the written communication and everything else spot on, people are going to think you're a bit dodgy and they won't come to you. Uh -huh. Yep, I agree with that. Any other reasons why presentation is important? Yes, Alan. Um, if you can't be precise in your presentation, then it implies you can't be precise in your arguments and undermines your credibility. That's a really good point. Thank you very much. Any other reasons why presentation is important? There are a few more. I mentioned before, if you're charging, I don't know, $400 an hour, people expect something that looks the part. Professional. Um, Professionalism. Yeah. Yes, Jay? Um, 
in my sort of industry that I do work in at the moment, you have to present um, material in a very, very professional manner because at the moment I'm presenting to ministers and all sorts of stuff like that in a completely different field. And you, your presentation is a reflection of your organisation in terms of the company you work for. So if you come across as very sloppy or disorganised, then that perception is carried on. So it's, it's like first impressions of someone. Um, what you see is what you get. So depending on who you're dealing with, you must present very well. Spot on. That's a really good answer. Look, I'll, I'll put another one in here, and that is that if you don't present well, it looks to me as though you haven't read carefully. All right. As an analogy, if you're involved in good communication skills, you must be a good listener, yes? If you're a good writer, you must be a good reader. If you're a good reader, you will pick up on small things that might be important. Osmosis. Does anyone know what osmosis is? Um, do you want the chemical version or the... <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a filtration of information or atoms in this case from one side of a membrane to another um, by virtue of pressure or chemical difference. Now, that I did not know, but the principle, yes, is the same. So osmosis in the context that I'm talking about is taking information that you read and you make it your own through osmosis, if you like. It sinks in. Thank you very much, Leone. That's it. It sinks in. So if you're reading carefully, you're going to pick up on certain little things and we want you to be part of the club. You're part of the club if you get the basics right. I'll give you another good reason for presentation. You might come up against someone like me that has this little eagle eye. I can't see it in my own things, but I can see it in others, and I can see it straight away. You can present something to me, and I'm not trying to be boastful. I'm not, that's not the, the point. But if you present something and the spacing is not consistent, I'll spot it straight away. If you present something and there's, um, you know, it's out of whack, it, you know, I'll, I will see it straight away. And it just undermines your credibility. It undermines your professionalism. So for all of those reasons, that's why presentation is important. And that's a very, very long explanation for my statement that I have tweaked the percentages in the rubric just to increase the value that I attribute towards the basics, which is presentation, okay? We've got to get that right now. But having said that, the work that's coming out of this cohort is really good. So there's no major problems, but I just want to make sure we get it right. Any questions, comments, criticisms? Feel free. Can I just go back to the assignment? Sorry. So yes, are you saying like we can't use the, are you just saying we can't use the Fair um, Works Australia Act yeah, don't, as no. supporting in the assignment? No, I really don't want the Fair Works okay. Australia Act to be part of your answer. That's not the point. But no, I'm glad you raised that, Sharon. Thank you. John, can I also ask another question? Yes, Leanne. So, any case we find, any case we find not just in the textbook but on Westlaw or LexisNexis, we are able to use? Absolutely. So it's being okay. real, I'm being really selective here, aren't I? Right. I'm saying to Sharon, I don't want legislation, and I'm saying to Leonie, I do want cases. And you might say, well, in order to explain the no, case, I, I need to refer to the legislation. So I know that we're talking fine little lines here, but. I guess what the point is that we're really here to talk about statutory interpretation. So the only legislation I really want to know about is the Interpretation Act. And I want to know about case law, not from a substantive law point of view, but from a statutory interpretation point of view. So you might refer to the CIC against um, Bankstown Football Club case as being relevant, not because we're talking here about an insurance claim, 
but because we're talking about statutory interpretation principles, and that's what that case, um, that why that case is relevant. So I hope that it makes some sense, Sharon and Leone in particular. Is that all good? Great. Any other questions? Okay, so yeah, yes. I had a yes, Jack. specific question. Uh, sorry, on section thirty-four A of the Commonwealth Acts Interpretation Act, and more to understand the definition of a delegate. Um, I posted on UCRU this afternoon. Um, so the question was: Does a delegate mean a person doing a task? For example, a policeman, or is it specifically related to someone that has been nominated to replace someone in a particular field? Um, I don't know if I've explained that very well. You have, but I can't answer that one immediately. Does, but I'll have a look at it. If it's on you, crew, that's great. Does anyone have a, okay? No or does anyone yeah. have any thoughts or response for Jay? Um, if I, I'll just, I'll post the actual um, the section, uh, if I can get it up there. Jay, what's the reason for the question? Uh, what's the background? Uh, <laughs> um, I guess it's to do with assignment two, perhaps. <laughs> Which is fine. I'm happy to and talk about assignment two. Particularly it's early enough. Yeah, okay. Um, so it's about the power, the functions and duties delegated under an act. So with specific reference, um, I used policeman as a sort of very shallow attempt at a smokescreen, but you could replace policeman with fireman in terms of uh, that power, function or duty has been delegated under that or any other act. And the delegate may exercise that power or may perform that function or duty upon the delegate's opinion, belief, or state of mind in relation to that matter. So Acts Interpretation Act, the Commonwealth, and then applying that to the Kingsland Fireman's Act. Is it relevant? All right. So no, that's a really good question, Jay. Does anyone have any thoughts about the applicability of the Commonwealth legislation in the context of what may appear to be a state issue. Uh, just thanks, Jay. I um, haven't looked at the um, assignment yet, so I just wanted to get a bit more background. So I'll, uh, I'll just mute my mic now. Thanks, Alan. Thanks, Jay. All right, so Angelina, you have a thought about this? Yeah. Can you hear me? Oh, okay. I'm using new headphones, sorry. Um, yes, I believe that um, that relates to someone that the government appoints to either enforce or um, carry out the duties in an act. So in the case that we're doing, it, I believe you could use that as relevant legislation, um, being that the Chief Commissioner was the person delegated the right to carry out the duties of that act. I could be wrong, but that's my thoughts. Thank you for that contribution. I won't offer an opinion at this stage, but if there are any other thoughts, and thanks for raising that, Jay. Um, just a, an uninformed thought, sorry, is that, um, People like police commissioners and chief medical officers, they're statutory positions that are built into legislation. So um, they're, they're delegated um, powers within the, the context of the legislation. I'm not sure if that helps or not. Thanks, Alan. Further thoughts or questions, Jay? Or anyone else? All right, well, we might move on. 
But um, thank you for that. And thank you, Jay. Thank you, um, Sharon, for posting some of those questions. And uh, I think Leone uh, added some um, of those initial questions as well. So thank you. What I'd like to do now is indicate that next year, 2017, early, we will attempt to catch up with the um, tutorial questions, the weekly questions. I haven't forgotten them, but I do want to see as many people as possible provide a response, and then we'll talk about those answers. And hopefully we won't run out of time. But for tonight, I want to walk through Chapter 6, which deals with intrinsic materials. This is essentially my take on the important parts of the chapter. I take it everyone's read it, but if not, um, you may find this useful. And if you have some comments to make as we progress, please do so. So chapter six of our text deals with the use of intrinsic materials within a statute. So we can't simply read the words of a section and then apply them without considering the surrounding sections and the whole of the act. And the authority for that proposition, which is now really well settled, was originally k &S Lake City Freighters against Gordon and Gotch from 1985. Of course, that's fine if you have the time and the resources and the financial backing to consider that type of statement in the context of litigation in the High Court. But for the clear majority of lawyers, a statement to that effect creates a good deal of uncertainty. And this is where, when we're talking about issues to do with statutory interpretation, we must always be mindful of the fact that there is not necessarily a right or a wrong answer. This area of practice more than any other area is, well, perhaps with the exception of constitutional law, is rife for decisions in the High Court that are split. Many of the decisions that we're talking about in this chapter and indeed the whole course come about as a result of law made in the High Court with at least one or more judges dissenting. So how difficult is it for a lawyer who's perhaps working in a regional, suburban or um, small practice to come up with the right answer when we have very well considered, highly credentialed judges of the High Court poring over material and coming up with different answers? We can treat that as a negative or we can treat it as a positive. I tend to think of it, we treat it as a positive. And what it means is that if you look at something which on its face is not in your favour, based on the fact that statutory interpretation involves looking at the whole context, we might be able to create a good argument that we can run. We may not win. It may not ultimately be correct, but at least we can run it. And statutory interpretation provides us with that confidence, of know confidence in knowing that there's always two sides to an argument. So that's what I take from the fact that when we're involved in statutory interpretation, we look at the whole of the act, we look at all the circumstances, and it means that we can argue different ways depending on what's best for our client in individual circumstances. Some provisions may be leading or dominant, whereas others are subordinate. And that statement is based on the authority of Project Blue Sky, against a Australian Broadcasting Authority from the High Court in 1998. Now that case is important and we'll talk more about that next week as well. So what are some of the intrinsic aids that we can find in a statute, a typical statute? Now can I open this up? What are some of the intrinsic materials that we talk about? Purpose that'd, be, of that'd be objects, definitions, purposes, um, statements of intent, um, even interpretation sections that might appear in, in acts. Yes, interpretation sections. Monique says titles, both long and short. Are there any other intrinsic materials? Dictionary. The, um, you know, the, yeah, the dictionary. Yep. Dictionary, yes, and the objects clause, the preamble, 
definitions, such as the dictionary says, J. So these are all examples of intrinsic materials, things that we find within the Act. Monique says schedules and notes and examples. Yes, and we, f we find those in our textbook. Okay, so we, we know what we're talking about when we talk about intrinsic materials. The long title. Why do we have a long title and why do we have a short title? Anyone got any thoughts? The long title explains what the act's about and the short title is just what you call it, like it's a shortened version so you don't get confused. A quick reference point. Okay. Yep, no, that's fine. Look, the idea is that the um, short title saves time, makes it easier to refer to the legislation. And often the short title is used in interpretation, but because of its nature being short, sometimes it doesn't help us very much. But in the text, they come up with a very good, Sanson comes up with a very good example and says, look, sometimes the short title actually tells us more than the long title. So the example is this, the Tax Laws Amendment, Temporary Flood and Cyclone Reconstruction Levy Act, the long, that's the short title, the long title is an act to amend the law relating to taxation and for related purposes. So the short title actually tells us more. In that context, I think it's fair to say that the long title, which is an act to amend the law relating to taxation, is more to do with the purpose of the legislation. The short title in that example, talking about temporary flood and cyclone reconstruction, is more about intent. So we go back to those basic principles. Um, so let's go back to an early example on page 90. If you've got your text, page 90, Sanson gives us a good example of what I'm trying to talk about when uh, giving the analogy to do with purpose versus intent. I'd actually tab this page because I think it's important. So what Michelle Sanson says when talking about purpose and intent is this. One could draw a simple analogy. If our purpose was to reach the airport, we may intend to achieve that purpose by, for example, taking a taxi, a train, a bus, a combination of train, bus and ferry, or we may be given a lift. Statutory purpose. Um, we may intend to pay for that by cash, voucher, credit card, or a kiss. So the intention relates to the aspect of carriage and payment, which contributes to achieving the overall purpose. So a statutory purpose is the focus on the why and the who, whereas intention focuses on the what and the how. Purpose looks at the why, the legislation is needed, and who it is directed towards. Intention deals with what is to be done to meet that purpose and how it should be implemented. So coming back to the short title versus the long title, in the example that the author gives, um, you can see that the short title is more to do with the intent and the long title is more to do with the overarching purpose. Right, so did anyone mention preamble when I asked for an example of an intrinsic material. I don't think anyone did. What's a preamble? And are they used very often these days? The introduction statement. I like that, introductory statement, yep. It sets the scene, doesn't it? It describes the background. A bit like an explanatory note, really. Um, what we do see is preambles are used in international treaties conventions, they're, they're used in constitutions, they were used widely in legislation but not so much now. So traditionally um, preambles were not considered as part of the material to be interpreted but that has changed. Um, and just as an aside, the Commonwealth Act section 13 2b provides that a preamble is now part of the Act but bear in mind that that section applies to all intrinsic materials now. So with the exception of the end notes, if you're reading common legislation, you're entitled to and you must interpret everything, all the stuff that's in between. Similar for Queensland, but we don't use the footnotes, but 
everything else is included in, in um, interpretation. Right, so that's the preamble. Objects clause, a few people came up with that. The objects clause is a way to communicate the intention of the parliament in making the uh, legislation. And it may be used in interpretation. Now, last week we talked about exhaustive and non-exhaustive. Can anyone remind me what we mean by an object that is, in, is exhaustive? Um, exhaustive was all encompassing. An objects clause that includes everything. Yes, um, that's it. Non-exhaustive was, does that make sense? Yep, it <laughs> does. That's good. Whereas non-exhaustive is really, um, the key word there is including, which means Subject. that... Um, yeah. okay. uh, I got non-exhaustive as suggestions and examples. So like it includes where there could be others. Exactly, yes. Sharon, do you have any views on that? Uh, no, basically what they said. <laughs> okay, good. All right. So you're perfectly entitled to um, look at the extrinsic materials as well because the objects clause is not exhaustive. Do you understand what I mean? So even though Section 13.2 of the Commonwealth legislation says you're allowed to look at the objects clause in the context of a of interpretation. Bear in mind that that does not mean it's exhaustive. You can still look at extrinsic materials, even though that's not what we're talking about in tonight's discussion. All right, so somebody else mentioned definitions. Definitions are um, included as part of the regime. Bear in mind that in some acts, like the um, Competition and Consumer Act, the definitions may be included in certain parts. So. Um, not only do you have to look out for a definitions section, but you have to look out for definition sections within individual parts of some legislation. Not much, but sometimes. So a definition is meant to be something to guide you in terms of the interpretation. It's not part of the substantive legislative provision. And the authority for that statement is Kelly, 2004 in the High Court. All right, um, have a look at that case example, exercise 6.1. I think that was a good example. Um, and just those of you who haven't read it, here's a quick overview. All right, so John, many years, a Qantas B747 captain. Employment came to an end when he turned 60. That was in accordance with Qantas policy that pilots not continue beyond that age. The relevant litigation revolved around section 170, a um, couple of different sections in 170 of the Commonwealth Industrial Relations Act, 88. An employer, this is subsection DE1, says an employer must not terminate in an employee's employment unless there is a valid reason connected with the employee's capacity or conduct. Got that? Section 170 DF says an employer must not terminate employment for any one of more of a number of reasons including age okay so you're not allowed to terminate unless there's a valid reason and you're not allowed to terminate because of age Qantas says you're over 60 you're no longer going to be a pilot with us john takes it to court can i just jump in yes yes yeah, shay Sorry, you guys. Sorry, I thought you were just jumping in to finish, so I can I can wait. All right, thank you. So, John says, "Look, I'm perfectly capable of doing the job. That's not disputed." But Qantas says, um, "You can't fly in certain areas of the world because they prohibit people who are more than 60." John says, "That's fine. I can still fly internally. I can fly to New Zealand. I can fly to Bali. So um, it's still." Uh, my, it's still an inherent requirement of the position that I can, um, so, sorry, um, being, it's not an inherent requirement of the position uh, that I um, be under the age of 60 because I can fly 
to a number of places. So what happened in that case? Shay, did you want to add something? I, I'm just reading it now, to be honest, but I was just looking at that. And if that was the policy of Qantas, John would have signed the employment contract, right? So if, if that's the employment contract and he agreed to those conditions, does this does these acts then overwrite the employment contract? Because for a company like Qantas or any other company for such, they should be doing their contracts in accordance with the law. So they can't, which, which, takes, which takes over? Anyone got obviously, any the, on obviously the act does, right? Like, so yeah, you, I think you're answering your own question, which is which is good, and I think you're right. Does anyone have any other thoughts, Alan? Uh, potentially, it does, um, because there may be um, there may be uh, interpretations that can void the contract that uh, was agreed between Qantas and the pilot. Exactly. And yeah, then but then he could So John, John could. Sorry. I'm so sorry. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, we can. I keep butting in at the last minute. But if um, if John if John can't fulfil his contractual agreement of being able to fly to specified locations, um, because that could be international law or whatever that is. I don't know what the actual law is of these other countries saying you can only be of a certain age if you're flying in this area. Um, unless those other countries or that was specified in the contract, it could be interpreted differently that he now can't fulfil his um, employment obligations because he can't fly to every country. He can now only fly to limited countries because of his age. Yes. And that was the argument. That was the, the, the real question in that case was, was it an inherent requirement of employment that John be able to fly to all international routes? And the trial judge and the High Court, the majority of the High Court said, yes, it is. And they took into account the whole context of employment, not just his physical capability to fly aeroplanes, but came to the conclusion that being under the age of 60 was an inherent requirement of the job. But what's interesting there is I've come back to the point I made earlier, that it wasn't clear cut. You had a number of judges, including, um, you know, a judge of the High Court who were in dissent of that opinion, came to a different view. So generally, statute prevails. The statute did prevail in this sense, in that um, it was held to be an inherent requirement of the job that he can fly everywhere. All right. So... Next thing, headings. Did anyone say headings as part of the, I don't think, I don't think, I can't see headings. All right, so headings are part of the intrinsic materials. When I went to law school. Yes, Sharon. Sorry, um, so why the judges have to, um, like, they, to get terminated at 65? Is it 65 or 60? 70. For a judge? 70. 70, is it? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, do they, they, why is that? It's, that's a really good question. Surely I'm that's not sure that anyone's taken that on yet. But I, I think you're right. I mean, it's just a statutory provision. But it's similar to that Qantas case, isn't it? Yeah. Like some people, some people could take to that as discrimination. Do you know what I mean? Of their age? Like, yeah. each person. Each person could be at any particular ages. And, you know, if you've got a disability or whatever, you can't discriminate and say you can't work for us because you have a disability. It's just because you can't work for us now because you've reached 70 or 60. Like, so it's interesting, especially we're in the modern days. And Do you I'm know what I mean? We're not, back, we're not back in the past where, yeah. I must say I've never actually turned my mind to that question, but that will be interesting. And I suspect you're right. one day a judge will take that on, I think. But anyway, we'll we'll see. We'll see. All right. So just coming back Could to... Could be one of you guys. What's that? What was that, sorry? I said it could be one of you guys that takes that on. One of us. Maybe. It could be someone in this room that takes on that litigation. Who knows? All right. So just in headings, when I went to law school, we were told very clearly... Headings not part of the statute, you can't take them into account 
when trying to interpret the statute. That's no longer the case. In 2011, the Commonwealth Statutory uh, Statute, uh, Acts Interpretation Act was changed. 13.2D was introduced. And as I mentioned before, pretty much everything in the Act is now fair game for interpretation. Same sort of thing in Queensland. Have a look at section 14.2. And that's um, for actually since an earlier time. All right, the next example in the text is a good one. Exercise 6.2. Lost in transit. I'll just briefly mention that case. So a business contracted a freight country, a company to carry a consignment of magazines. On the way, the carrier's delivery vehicle driver was negligent. The vehicle was involved in a collision. And the consignor wanted to recover the cost of the goods, but the carrier said, look, there's an exclusion of liability clause in our conditions of carriage. Uh, we're not liable for loss. Now, that clause was challenged by the consignor, the owner of the goods, because of Section 133 of the Motor Vehicle Acts in South Australia. And that said that a contract where a person contracts in advance out of any right to claim damages for negligence is, to that extent, void. The carrier said, Section 133 only applied to bodily injury, not to property damage. And the basis of the carrier's argument was that that clause, which if it was held to be applicable, would mean that the carrier had to pay, the carrier said it doesn't apply. Because let's have a look at the heading within which that clause is housed. And that clause um, that heading relates to bodily injury. Anyway, the court, and this was um, KNS Lake City Freighters against Gordon and Gotch, went to the High Court, and the majority in the High Court decided that the section did cover property damage as well as personal injury, and the heading to the part did not limit its operation. So, on the one hand, I'm saying to you, you are entitled to take into account what's in the heading, but on the other hand, I'm saying in the Gordon and Gotch decision, the court said the heading is not um, helpful to the carrier, um, to the uh, consignor, but we're going to not limit the operation of the section. Now, two judges saw the heading was not appropriate for section 133, and the provision could not be read down or confined to the subject matter. Another judge simply said section 133 operated independently of the heading, and therefore the heading did not affect it. So again, we see examples of arguments both ways. All right, so that's headings. Schedules. Somebody did mention schedules when I asked for a list of intrinsic materials. A schedule is simply an area where detailed information is housed. But here's the important point about a schedule. It's the substantive provision of the Act that gives application to the schedule. So that's where we look at first instance. All right, we all know what schedules mean. You know, schedulize, it's at the end normally. Notes. What do we mean by notes? Any thoughts? Yes, Grace? Uh, I was just, I'm a little bit confused about schedules. Um, like, I mean, usually a schedule is like you make a list of things to do sort of thing. Is that similar? Or? No, it, it, not quite. The schedule like in is, a timely manner or? Yeah, a schedule is as in a list is different, um, but a schedule as in, oh, sorry, as a list of things is different to, um, to do, but a schedule is a list of things that apply in a certain circumstance. So a good example of this might be under the Retail Shop Leases Act, a Queensland piece of legislation. In the Act itself, it, it says something like a retail shop lease is a, um, is a lease which relates to a use, which is a, a retail lease use. 
And if you look in the schedule, there's a whole long list of things that are described as a retail shop, le a retail lease um, or use. So it includes sort of things like hairdressers and, and things of that nature. So rather than have the old fashioned drafting that we used to see where it says, you know, a long, long list of things, basically the act says, have a look at the schedule and there you might have 10 pages of material, of detail. So when we're looking at what's in the schedule, we have to go back to the original section to make sense of it. I hope that answers your question, Grace. Thank you. All right. It so does. Thanks. No, that's good. So notes. Notes. So notes are margin notes, things that are in the margin. It might be head notes. It might be footnotes. It might be end notes. And again, have a look at section 13.3 of the Commonwealth Act because all material is included, not the end notes, but all material. And have a look at section 35C of the Queensland Act. So notes are taken into account, but not footnotes or end notes. It's different in different sections, uh, different states around Australia. So be aware of that. All right, so punctuation. Um, again, go back to the all, in, all um, material clause in the Commonwealth and have a look at section 14.5 of Queensland. Examples. You'll often see this. Um, lately, legislation will helpfully provide an example. So to better explain the act, they'll put an example. They'll say this is, so for example, and then they'll go through a scenario. It's really good. I'll try and, I'll try and dig one out and show you what I mean by that. So that now is part of something that can be considered in the interpretation of legislation, but it can't override the substantive provision, but it can help to interpret it. And finally, penalties. Have a look at Section 4D of the Crimes Act, Commonwealth, or Section 41 of the Queensland Act. Okay, that's all I propose to cover for tonight. You've been very patient. Thank you for your contributions. As we wrap up now for Christmas and New Year, are there any questions or comments? Um, I just wanted to say for the problem three today, I thought I'd look at the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders Recognition Act. Um, and it was really small. It was like just a few paragraphs. Okay. Which yeah. is unusual for an act, isn't it? It is, yes. But um, legislation there is There was actually no object section. What was that? Sorry, Grace? Yeah. Yeah, that's true. There was no object section, but I, because it was a recognition act, I think it was like different. Um, but yeah, they just had like a recognition section and uh, sun, uh, was it a sunrise clause? Sunset yeah. clause. So that was interesting. But. A sunset okay. clause, yeah, sorry. Yep. Um, yeah, but I did think it would be more, uh, more in depth. It didn't really say a lot. So. Mm. That can happen, yep, thank you. All right, so any other questions or comments? Thank you very much, I'll wrap it up then. Um, enjoy your break, you've done well, you deserve it, and we'll see you in two weeks. So from memory, it's Thursday the 5th of January, so there's no tutorial in between Christmas and New Year. So Merry Christmas, everyone. Happy New Year. All the best, and we'll see you next time. Merry Christmas. Bye. Thanks, Bye. John. Thanks, Bye. John. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas.